Good morning, Rivers Edge Fellowship. Good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord once again. Amen. We're going to look at Psalms 23 today. A very familiar song to us. But it seems how we're going to be singing that song today. I thought we will just read that song today as well. So uh, welcome all of you that are joining us on Facebook uh, and online. We are glad to have you this morning. In Psalms 23, it reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Psalm 23 reminds us that in life or in death, in times of plenty or want, God is good Amen. and worthy of our trust. Yes, the yes. psalm uses the example of a shepherd's care for his sheep uh, to describe the wisdom, the, the wisdom, the strength, and the kindness of our great and awesome God. And truly, he is a God. And uh, as, the, as the psalmist proclaims, the Lord is my shepherd. Mm -hmm. He's my shepherd, and I shall not want. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a great and awesome thought, that no matter what the circumstance, no matter what it is, I don't have need or care or concern or anxiety because the Lord is my care keeper. Amen. He's my provider. Amen. He's my keeper. He's my sustainer. He's everything that I need. And that's a hallelujah. Amen. Pray with Amen. me this morning. Father God, thank you this morning. Thank you that truly, truly, truly you are a great and awesome God and you are a good, good shepherd. Mm -hmm. And we thank you this morning. We thank you that you are the good shepherd. Because, Lord, you don't leave us in want. You don't leave us lacking. You don't leave us, oh, God, to, to, to beg or to steal. Because, Lord, you will provide all of our needs according to your riches and glory, according to your word. So, truly, Lord, we are grateful for the, for the, eye, for the thought and for the comfort of knowing that, that you, oh, God, will care for us mm -hmm. in times of, of plenty and in times of need. You're always there. In life or in death, dear Heavenly Father, you're there. You are everything, oh God, that we need, and we thank you this morning, oh God, for being exactly what we need. And Lord, we want to lift up those this morning, oh God, who may be grieving, who may be heavy of heart. Oh Lord, I just want to want to, want to reassure them this morning that you are the good shepherd, yes. that you are the God who provides and meets us at every point in our lives. Yes. Whatever the need is to have me, Father, you are the provider for it. And we thank you this morning, oh God that you willfully and you give freely to Heavenly Father and you live graciously and, and, and Lord we thank you this morning oh God for being our help Lord we thank you because there's none like you you are the great and you're the awesome God and truly Lord we, 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 we trust you this morning we trust you with everything that we have because Lord we can't keep it ourselves dear Heavenly Father but you oh God you have all power you have all ability and you can do anything but fail. And we thank you this morning, oh God, for not failing us. Oh God, but forgive us, dear Heavenly Father, for failing you. Forgive us, dear Heavenly Father, when we fall short, and as we do fall short, dear Heavenly Father, you're yet still there, comforting and waiting with open arms to receive us back to yourself. And what a wonderful thought that is. Thank you, oh God, for being our help, for being our God, for being our good shepherd this morning. We thank you, we praise you, give you all the glory in this place today. In Jesus, name, In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning once again to our friends who are joining us online today. 
uh, take the time and invite someone to join you online. Share share that you're worshiping today uh, with River's Edge uh, on Facebook or online. We invite you to uh, join us as we celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, as we lift him high in this place, in our yes. homes, in, in our communities. God, you are lifted high. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. And, and this morning, for a moment, we want to reflect on the power of the cross and at the cross was where our redemption where our redemption was paid where our reconciliation to Christ was had amen it was where we first saw the light of Jesus amen at the cross yes a debt that we could never repay amen amen thank you Jesus amen Drops. Uh.
trust you that we can wait anticipation God for you to fix it for your return God as the one and only true living God you are you are a living God that 
created the entire universe, God, but you choose to love mere humans as us, God. That while we were still yet sinners, you died for us. Scripture said someone might be willing to die for a good person. But you die for us wretched people. Even though there was no good in us, God. And we say thank you, Jesus. reconciliation with us God that you chose to come down from heaven to this awful place of earth to live a sinless life do miracles God be accused of things that you would never do God you God they hung you high and they stretched you wide but by your stripes God we are healed and we are so grateful God God that as the, as the scripture says that while we were still sinners God you died for us That you met us all on the road of Damascus, God, of our lives, God. We thank you, God. We pray for those that are still on that road, God. That they would reach out for you, God. That they would turn to you, Jesus. Because you are the only way. You are the only way, God. There are not several ways. You are the only way, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. another one I'm free <laughs> hallelujah 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 indeed amen you know that's only part of the story though right because when when hell loses one heaven gains one yeah it says all heaven rejoices at the saving of a new soul praise God for our praise team praise the Lord for our praise team 
Amen. Amen. We're so thankful to the Lord for you. Just want to share a couple things with you before we um, jump into the Word of God today. Uh, first, I want to say welcome to everybody um, that, that's, that's, that's joined us online. We praise God for you. Uh, thank the Lord that you have um, set aside some time today um, to gather around and worship. And um, Lord, I, I, Lord knows I miss you here. And we're looking forward to uh, prayerfully very soon um, having everyone um, that wants to to come back into the building. Um, so next week is first Sunday. Uh, we are planning to have communion. Um, you know, so we'll continue to keep an eye on things, and we'll let you know if there are any changes in terms of our uh, meeting in person or not. Um, <clears throat> but if we are um, still virtual uh, primarily next week, uh, we will uh, go around and take communion supplies to, to everyone that would like them. And so... Um, I, uh, I look forward to at least, if, if no other time, getting a chance to see you uh, next Saturday when we come around to bring those communion supplies. Uh, of course, um, we'll be coming up here uh, starting on Tuesday, I believe, the 1st of February. And February um, is a month. We've got some great uh, things coming up. And I'm not going to make a bunch of announcements right now because we've got a few weeks for those. But uh, we'll begin to uh, just share with you the things that are going to be happening uh, in the month of February. A bunch of exciting things going on. Of course, it'll be Black History Month, and so some of that will be surrounding how we um, observe and celebrate that month as well. So I want to encourage you to grab your Bible, grab a pen and paper, and uh, be prepared as we turn our hearts and our attention to the Word of God. I want to encourage you as well today that um, worship service is not a time for multitasking. Um, I want to encourage you to, you know, if you've got your computer in front of you, TV on the background, turn the television off. And turn your attention towards God just for this short period of time. It's just a, just a short period of time. Turn your attention to God. Whatever other thing you might, it's, it's easy to do when we're at home. Believe me, I know this. <laughs> it's easy to do uh, when we're on um, the Internet and we're doing Zoom calls and, 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 and things of that nature. It's easy to, to, to do one thing or another while you're engaged there. So I just want to encourage you just, um, and, 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 and even as well, starting next week, if we're still virtual, um, just, just prepare your heart and your mind to be willing to set aside all other distractions, any other things that may uh, want to draw your attention and pull at your heart while uh, we are in our time of worship. So um, we're going to go to the, the gospel according to Matthew, the 22nd chapter. And today we're going to talk about the standard for love. The standard for love. Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40 is what we'll be reading. Here's what it says. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Would you pray with me? So yes, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege, Lord. It is just a blessed privilege to, to come into your presence, dear God, though um, we may not be um, face to face in, in a way, um, in person, in one place, but God, um, we believe that as we all touch and agree in prayer, as we all touch and agree through your word, dear God, that, um, Lord, we are together. <laughs> We're together in your presence, regardless of, of where we may be geographically. Mm -hmm. And so, so, God, I pray that as we gather together around your word, that you would just speak to our hearts in a way, dear God, that will begin to shape and mold us, dear Lord, as we, as we focus in on the topic of love, um, and not just this sermon series, but for the, for the year, to let love abound in our lives, dear God, that... Uh, Lord, you began to break our hearts and shape us yeah. to be the loving people that you've called us to be. And as we look at this, this standard of love that you've set before us, this high bar of love, dear God, help us to examine where we are and to know, dear God, that your love for us is great. 
and that you're drawing us into a love relationship that is like none other. Father, I pray, dear God, that if there's anyone who, who would just perhaps take the time to, to tune into to this sermon today, dear God, that you would use your word as a way to draw them to yourself. Oh God, that if they're unsaved, that you would, uh, Lord, that you would save their soul through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh God, if they are, have wandered or if they have, um, Lord, just taken you for granted, whatever, whatever may be the, the, the shape, the condition of, a, of, a, of an individual, dear God, that you would, Lord, take them from where they are and bring them, dear God, into an exciting, loving relationship with you. Yeah. We pray that you would do that just today. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. So when we talk about love in the Bible, this passage really stands out as the high bar. And that is why we've titled this the standard of love. It doesn't say a whole lot. It's not, it's not multiple pages. It's just a small paragraph, truly, that says so much. It's really hard to spend the short time we have here in really expressing exactly what it is that it's, that it's getting at. This passage provides for us the how more than it does the what. So as we talk about this as a standard for love, first I just want to um, just kind of examine what is a standard. A standard from Webster's Dictionary says, an ideal or thing used as a measure, norm, or model in comparative evaluations. And so when you think about love for God and love for man, this is the standard that your experience should be compared to. This is the standard. This is the standard. So we talked about a couple weeks ago, I kind of shared with you all my love for golf and ice cream once again. I brought my friend, my seven iron, uh, back to the pulpit with me as an object lesson. I kind of like the feel of it in my hands, too. You know, I would love to just stand up here and swing it a few times, but uh, we don't have time for all that. <laughs> But, but as I think about those things that I say that I love, or those things that I really do believe that I love, I have to ask myself the question, how can I apply this standard to my love of other things in my life? At first glance, the answer is no. You know, how, can, how can I apply my love for golf or my love of ice cream to this passage? At first glance, it's like those, those things are oil and water. Those things don't mix. But I believe that... The Bible in, in, in the way that, it, that, that we're to receive it and to understand it and to take it into our hearts challenges us to see how we can apply the things of God in ways that are not always given to us clearly on its pages. So I look to these earthly standards of things that I love, but I have to compare them to the heavenly standards that are expre expressed and exposed in the scripture. So I believe it's important for us to make these connections because otherwise we fall into senses of guilt about things that we love that may not seem so spiritual, right? Um, I've had those seasons in my life of feeling that way about golf, of feeling guilty about going out and playing, feeling guilty about wanting to play so bad. <laughs> Because there's always something else that needs to be done, right? There's always somewhere else I could go. There's always something else I could read. There's always someone else that needs ministering to. So as we talk about the love of these things, you know, we, we, we mentioned back a couple weeks ago, we kind of examined actually that all love isn't the same love. That, that the unfortunate reality of the English language is that it boils down all these aspects of what love is, that in other languages, and particularly as we think about Greek, um, seven different words, at least seven different words, that we boil down into one word to try to express all these different ways that we experience what we call love. So what we have before us again is a standard for love. I believe that we have a standard for love in, in everything that we love. And I've, I've got a standard 
for how I love ice cream. <laughs> now, of course, it's a very subjective standard, but it is a standard. You see, I may not like what you like, and you may not like what I like, but still, that's my standard. <laughs> because it's subjective, I must be willing to adjust my standard because I may not know what I'm missing out on if I just reject everything other than the things that I like. I think, unfortunately, that oftentimes is the same approach that many of us take to love. We have a very subjective standard that we use, and we fit our personal standards over the top of it. If it doesn't fit, then we're all unwilling to give ourselves to that love. See, the beauty of this passage, the beauty of what the Bible declares for us, is that the standard of love is an objective truth. It is something that comes to God or comes from God to us. It is a standard that must overlay the top of all other ideals of what love is. The Bible doesn't present us with a standard that we uh, just make adjustments to on the fly and as we want to. <laughs> now, it can get messy at times, but it's still the truth of the matter. See, I understand very well my love for ice cream is limited. It's based on my personal experiences, my taste buds, and my unwillingness to try other types of frozen desserts. <laughs> See, that kind of limited love will never reach the potential of what this passage describes for us. See, the love in this passage is pure and complete. It expresses the reality of how we can be satisfied in love and thus in this life. See, this is the standard, the high bar. Everything else we practice until we get to this level. So here's what this passage is telling us. I want to go back and, and look at it just a little bit at a time. First, that loving God requires exclusive devotion. Loving God requires exclusive devotion. So here's what's going on. There's a, a group of Pharisees and Sadducees, and they're all together. And one of them, who is a lawyer or a scribe, it, it may say in some translations, he asks Jesus this question we find in verse 36. He says, what is the great commandment in the law? What is the great commandment? He's asking Jesus, of all of the commandments, what is the greatest thing that a person should know? And then Jesus goes on and he responds to him. By saying, and he said to him in verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Jesus says, look, there is a bar of love that must be reached towards, that must be, be set before us. It must be recognized as the reality of, of how our lives must intertwine with the life of God. Of course, this comes from Deuteronomy 6.5. It's a part of the Shema. This is a, um, these, are, these are verses in that, in, in that passage that um, the faithful Jew would recite twice a day. So they knew this. They knew this well. Those, those faithful Jews, at least, those people who, who, who followed the law as it was given to them. And, you know, this was an argument that they had regularly uh, amongst them. How, how do we see the greater laws and the lesser laws? How do we experience the greater laws and the lesser laws? So Jesus sets the standard before them. I use the phrase exclusive devotion because this is a type of love that we can only have for God. The Bible describes this type of love as that which is exclusive to God himself, a devotion that we are to give to him and to no one else. This is a standard of, of love that's unique to how we love God, but it is also the beginning of how we learn to love one another. So loving, loving God um, demands us to be all in, heart, soul, and mind. And then when we look over in the book of Mark, they add the word strength. He adds the word strength. I wonder what a poll would say if we asked a thousand Christians today if they loved God like this. I would imagine that, um, that many of them would, would say, if they were honest, would say no. 
I would imagine that a large portion of them would also say, it don't take all that to love God. You see, that's the, that's the culture that we live in. That's the Christian culture, unfortunately, but that is the, the culture of, of the human heart in America. You know, haven't, I, I don't know, as, as believers, have you ever heard someone say that to you when, you talk in, when you're talking to them about the things of God and how you're living your life as a Christian and how you go about each day and how you feel about God and your prayer life and things like that and, 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 and maybe even your quote-unquote time that you spend in ministry around the church or wherever it is that they may reply to you, it don't take all that. <laughs> that statement comes from a place of ignorance. Amen. That statement comes from the place of a person who has decided that they want to love God like they love ice cream. That they want to love God like they love golf. Oh. They don't want to give God an exclusive devotion that is unmatchable, unmeasurable in any other way. So I don't know about you, but when I read a passage like this, one of the first things that happens is I have a question that comes in my mind that asks me, how do I do that? <laughs> how, do I, how, how do I love God like that? How, how can I do that? Jesus answers this question with a simple statement in John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Isn't there an interesting connection here? Now, I think it's important to notice that when asked this question by the lawyer, Jesus doesn't say, keep God's commandments. He says, love the Lord with all of your being, with everything that you are. Every faculty of your being, everything that is conscious and subconscious. Love God with everything that you are. Every heartbeat, every tear, every bite of food, every step of your feet. God doesn't say to us, Jesus doesn't say to us, obedience is the highest order. He says, no, love is. See, because you can obey without love. <laughs> but love will move you into obedience. You see, obedience without love is tyranny. But love with obedience is devotion. And so God, God then says to us, look, in order for you to truly live out what I am commanding you to do, in order for you to truly live out how I want you to live, first you must start with loving me. And not just loving me any old kind of way, not just the standards of human love, but a standard that goes way beyond everything else. God never demands that we love anything else in this way. It is exclusive to love him and devote our lives fully to God. You know, strangely, we don't seem to have a problem with obedience when it comes to other areas of our lives, right? <laughs> See, if I love shoes, I'd make it a priority in my budget to buy some shoes. <laughs> I'm going to research the kind of shoes that I want. I'm going to go and I'm going to try them on. I've got, a, I've got a, a, a certain level of standards that I ascribe to, that I obey in order to live out those things that I really love and give my life to. But for some strange reason, when we start talking about obedience to God, it starts getting kind of weird. Wow. See, people want to love without obedience. Of course, you know, obviously they don't, don't, don't want to obey with, without love. But people want to love and not obey. And so again, as this is the standard before us, it's important for us to recognize that this exclusive kind of love that God is calling us to is that which draws us into a love relationship that causes us to say, look, God, all I want to do is what you want me to do. I love you so much that all I want to do is what you want me to do. Mm 
This standard of love is exclusive to God and to nothing else. See, the beauty of this exclusive devotion to God is that it makes every other love better and sweeter. See, when my life becomes disciplined by God, and this is, this is one of the greatest side effects of obedience to God, is that when I love God that much and I say, God, I just want to be who you want me to be, I want to do what you want me to do, my life starts to become disciplined. One of the benefits of loving God is obeying him and becoming disciplined. And so when I become disciplined, I find that my level of enjoyment of other things begins to increase. <laughs> See, my love for ice cream has a tendency to get undisciplined. <laughs> my love for ice cream has a tendency to um, overwhelm good judgment and decision making. <laughs> Unfortunately, the side effects of that undisciplined action, you can see very well on the outside what happens to the human body. <laughs> but also there are things going on on the inside that you can't really see until it gets worse than you want it to be. Discipline is good for us. That's a part of the value of reading through the New Testament. That's what we're doing this year. Uh, thank God for all of you River's Edge friends and family that are uh, continuing on. We're coming up to the fifth week already, right, of reading through the New Testament. Just hang in there. Keep, keep, keep plugging away at it. One chapter, uh, five days a week, will get us through the New Testament by the end of the year. Um, and we've just started. So, yeah, it's, kinda, it's, nice and, it's nice and kind of an easy journey when you first get started. When you, when you get into it for a little while, when we start nudging up against May and June, especially when summer starts getting busy, um, it's a little bit harder, but I'm going to continue to encourage you along the way. So there's this ex exclusive devotion, and then Jesus goes on. He says, loving people requires equitable treatment. Loving people requires equitable treatment. So verse 39 says this, and the second is like it. This is Jesus continuing in his thought. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So this dude gets more than what he bargains for, right? He asks Jesus, what's the great commandment? Jesus gives him a great commandment and he gives him another one too. <laughs> You got to know that's how God is, right? God's always going to give you more than what you bargained for. Isn't that good stuff? That's good stuff. And, and the reason he does that is because these two things are intertwined. These two things are very connected. He says, look, the second is to love your neighbor. Because, because what, what Jesus wants us to understand is that unless you're loving your neighbor, then you truly aren't loving God. Unless there is an overflow of this love in your life being displayed and how you are treating the people that you're connected with, and as we'll look at here in a moment, even people you're not connected with, even people you don't even know, unless there is love lived out in your life, then it's, it's virtually impossible for you to say that you're doing the first if the second isn't happening. And that is why he declares that on these two depend all the law and the prophets. So I want you to finish the sentence with me. Do unto others. That's right. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. That's right. It's not do unto others as they did unto you. That's not, that's not it. I mean, you may hear that in, in popular culture. People, people are saying that quite a bit. That's not, that's not the biblical way that, that that phrase shapes out is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right? So there are many people that can finish the statement that aren't even Christians. They don't know anything about the Bible because it has become ingrained into um, the lives of, of, our, of our society, of our culture. Matthew 7, 12 says it this way. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. See, this is at the heart of what Jesus is saying in the second commandment. 
The way you want people to treat you is the standard for how you treat them. Let me say that again. The way you want other people to treat you becomes a standard for how you treat them. There's an important word in what Jesus says here that we're going to deal with for a second, and it's the word neighbor. He said you should love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't say your brother or your sister. He doesn't say your enemy, because he deals with those in other places. He uses this word neighbor. So there's another passage that is important relative to this ideal of neighbor, because as we go to Luke 10, 29, we'll see this question, who is my neighbor, was asked of Jesus one time before. It says Luke 10, 29, it says, but he desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So this story in Luke 10, let me, just, let me just summarize it for those of you that are not familiar with this story. This is the story of the Good Samaritan. The story is about a man who on his way um, down the road was, was jumped on, beat up, and left for dead. Stripped of his clothes. I mean, he was, just, he was just treated foul, left for dead, left on the side of the road. So while he's lying there on the side of the road, here comes a priest, you know, a priest, a, a godly man, right, who sees him and passes over to the other side of the street to avoid him. And then here comes another man, a Levite, another godly man, a man who works in the church, good deacon, right? <laughs> Does the same thing that the priest did. So the preacher and the deacon both go to the other side of the street to avoid this guy. And then here comes a guy that's a Samaritan. Now Samaria, uh, just the short of it is this is a group of people that the Jews of that day had no dealings with. They didn't respect them. Um, they thought that they were um, kind of half-breeds of Jews. And so, um, they, and, and, and of course, there's some other things that have happened, you know, in the history of the, the relationship between uh, the Jews and the Samaritans. But, but, but they were a group that were thought little of by the Jews. So here comes a Samaritan, and he sees him there. And he takes him, and he bandages his wounds, and he cleans him up. And he puts him on the back of his donkey and he takes him down to the nearest motel. Signs him in. He tells the, the innkeeper, the guy that, that runs the motel, he says, look, take care of him. And he, he gave him some money to take care of him. He said, whatever I owe you for his care, when I come back through, I'll pay, I'll pay for that. And so in this passage in Luke 10, 36 and 37, here's how, how it ends. Jesus asked this question, which of these three do you think pr proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell amongst the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. You go and do likewise. So this question, who is my neighbor? Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? Uh, in this other passage, we see Jesus describing this neighbor as a person who needs to be shown mercy to. Basically, whoever it is along the way, that when you look upon their lives, you determine that there is a need that they have. You will do the best that you can to meet that need. So I use the word equitable to say that loving people requires equitable treatment. I use this word equitable, and it is it's defined as fair and equal treatment. This is a standard of love Jesus is talking about. Love isn't just a good feeling or based on things going the way that I want them to go. Love produces a standard for life that says, I will go out of my way to help others when they're in need. Love is, doesn't care about convenience, it doesn't care about schedules, nor does it care about ability. It does require one thing, and that is a want to. And that want to is motivated by love. Love is the necessary standard that must draw us into doing the things that God has called us to do, but also push us into doing the things that God wants us to do. You see, love like this will make you pray for opportunities to help people. 
Love like this will cause you to make room in your schedule for helping others. Why? Because that is what you would want other folks to do for you if you were in their situation. You see how those two things connect? Doing for others as you would want them to do for you. See, if I was that guy on the road, I would want somebody to come and help me. If, if I was that guy that had been beat, beat up enough for dead, I would, I would want, you know, <laughs> honestly, yeah, I would want the preacher and the deacon to come and help me. I'd want him, I'd want those two and the Samaritan all together to come and help me. <laughs> you know, we want all the help we can get when we're down and out, when trouble is on the horizon. And so what Jesus is saying is that same way that you want others to help you is the way you ought to help others. You know, last week I threw out a challenge to everybody. I challenged you to go and, 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 and look to a situation where loving someone may be difficult for you and go and make inroads, make a decision to, to, to have an interaction that, that would make a difference. And um, Ramon shared with me just the other day about an experience he had. Um, and he took the challenge to love someone when it was hard. He has a student um, that he's had some difficulties with in the past, and the relationship hasn't always been um, the best relationship between him and the student. So much so that um, trust has been compromised in some ways. So Ramon decided this week to respond to this young person in a way that would show the love of God, and the student responded with humility, and it appears that they are on the road to having a better relationship. So I don't know anything about that student, but I do know one thing. <laughs> Times is hard. <laughs> Times is hard. And I'm sure that student is experiencing some of the difficulties on the inside, just like all of us are experiencing with, you know, not being able to go to church and having to wear masks and the schools getting shut down and all the different things that are happening, having to interact with people through cameras and screens that has a negative effect on people, some greater and some lesser. So I don't know anything about this young man, but I do know that Ramon's act of love has, has made a difference in that kid's life. And we don't know what that's going to look like going forward. We just don't know when we interact with someone according to the standards of God's love we just don't know how that will impact them for the rest of their life. So you, we don't know if that's a turning point for them. That could very well be a turning point for that young man. That could be the place in his life where the fog lifted, where the clouds moved away, where the sun began to shine in his heart in such a way that now he sees things differently than he did before. See, that's how God wants to use us, my friends. That's how God wants to use us. So here's the standards of love that we're called to for love, loving God and loving man. There's this exclusive devotion that draws us into obedience and this, this, this equitable treatment of others that draws us into treating others the way that we want to be treated. So, so let, me, let me challenge you here, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Don't say you love God if you're unwilling to obey him. Because God has a standard for love. And that love doesn't fit. Now, um, if you want to love God and you're unwilling to obey him, my prayer for you is that God begins to break through that shell to help you by, by using sermons like today to help you to understand that um, there's, this, there's this exclusive devotion to loving God that is unlike any other kind of love. You can't say uh, haphazardly that you love God the same way that you love other stuff. That's not the kind of love that it takes to love God. And then also, <laughs> don't say that you love me if you're unwilling to treat me the way you want to be treated. There's a standard for love that is based on truly desiring what is best for a person without all of the other qualifiers that we want to add in 
to fix it up and make it right in our minds. So love, love is hard. I'm not going to stand here and say to you that these standards are easy. Love is hard. <laughs> golf is hard. <laughs> I don't know if that's one of the reasons I love golf or one of the reasons I hate golf. Because I oftentimes say it's the game that I love to hate and hate to love. <laughs> because golf is hard. Golf is described, even by professionals, as the game where you manage your misses. In other words, you're going to hit a bad shot more often than you're going to hit a good shot. Take advantage of the good shots, but manage the bad shots. And so just like the great base, greatest baseball players hit 300, in other words, they hit three out of 10 times, they go to the batter's box, they actually get on base. That's not a great percentage. <laughs> That's very similar to the game of golf. That more often you hit bad shots than you hit good shots. It's a hard game. <laughs> but when you hit a good shot, <laughs> It is so good, it makes you want to come back and do it again. <laughs> when you hit a good shot, it feels so good, you think it's time to go sign up for the PGA or the LPGA Tour. When you hit a good shot, you feel like you got it all figured out. And that's the way love is, isn't it? That's the way love is. When it's, when it's hard and difficult, you know, we can, we can um, love and not love so much a person at the same time. We could, we could have the, the great highs and the great lows all in a, in a, in a, in a, in a period of, of moments with, with the same person. That's what love is. Love is hard. So God is calling us to love him with this, this exclusivity that, that, is, that is higher than anything else. But I want to say in many ways, golf is like loving people. Golf is like loving people. It can be hard most of the time. But when it's on, baby, it's on. <laughs> when it's good, it is good. And when it's good, it's so good that the bad parts don't seem so bad. That's why True love is so necessary when we talk about relationships. Not fuzzy feelings and, and emotionally charged, and now don't get me wrong, that stuff is a part of what it means to love. But when we base love on those things, brothers and sisters, we find ourselves set up for a bad experience. So let's continue to look to God for the love that we need and that he would conform us to this love, this, this exclusive devotion of mind, soul, heart, and strength. That we could give ourselves entirely to God and to God alone in this way. And then let us dig deep to ask this question, how can I apply this standard of love to my life? How can I love others the way that I love myself? Not just want that for others, but actually let that live through my life. I'm thankful because the greatest love that's ever been shown was love that was given to us through God by the giving of his son, Jesus Christ. That love that God has for us is one that displays the type of love that Jesus is talking about here that God gave His only begotten Son, the Bible says that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible tells us that God demonstrates His own love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Truly, God didn't wait for the best shot to happen in order to love us. <laughs> God loved us while we were hitting bad shots all over the course. When we were lost and desperate in our sin, we were far from God and not even considering who He is. He loved us first, the Bible says.
So he's calling you today to return that love to him, that same kind of love that he poured out on Calvary's cross where Jesus died to take your sin penalty. That's the kind of love that God expressed towards us. God is just asking us to return that love back to him, that same kind of love. Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb, but the Bible tells us that the stones rolled away from that grave and that he rose again on the first day with all power of heaven and earth in his hand. Jesus is calling you today. I just want to say to you, if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you don't know what it means to be a Christian, reach out to me through Facebook or, or at, our, at our website at riversedgekc.org. Let, let me know, let us know that you're ready to become a Christian. You're ready to know Jesus. You're ready to know this love. You want to experience this love that only God can give. We're waiting. We're waiting just as God is waiting to hear from you. Would you pray with us? Thank you, Father, for this time, and we thank you for this standard of love that, Lord, can't be compared to any other, any other type of love. Yes, God, we love all kinds of things in our, in our little worlds, each of us. We've got long lists of things that we, that we love. God, help us to understand how our lives can be used by you to reflect your love. Help us to have that exclusive devotion, dear God, that, um, that draws us into living for you. Obedient lives that, 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 that place us into living a life of discipline, a life, oh God, that sets boundaries and guidelines that are given by you. Oh God, and then help us to be a people that loves others like the Samaritan who stopped on the side of the road to help someone they didn't know who gave of himself in such a way. Of course, the Samaritan, we know God is a, is a picture of Jesus. How all of us were beaten and broken and bloody on the side of the road. <laughs> and Jesus stopped to help us and to get us into the right place. Thank you for that job. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, I pray that as we end our time here today, um, God, you will continue to guide us and lead us throughout this week. Help us, Lord, to always remember that we belong to you, that we're your children. Oh, God, help us to, to position ourselves to love you with a devotion that is higher than any other. Oh, Lord, and help us to find ways that we can love our neighbors as ourselves. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Amen.